Okay, welcome to the William A. Channon Library. I'm Chris Francolini, Dean of the Library, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event. Um, first of all, I would like to, in addition to welcoming all of you, give a special shout out to a special guest, Dean Bryant Keith Alexander, Dean of the College of Communication oh. and Fine Arts, <laughs> right there in the front row. <laughs> Um, so tonight we are celebrating the official opening of our Archives and Special Collections Spring Exhibition, Making a Scene, the Process of Stage Design. The exhibition was curated by our university archivist, Lauren Zukowski Longwell. It features works from one of our newest collections, the Charles E. Irvin Theater Collection. <laughs> and a special guest tonight. Um, the collection is comprised of 13 boxes and one map drawer, but the contents is way more interesting than that. You will be hearing more about Professor Irvin in a few minutes, but first I want to tell you a little bit about the collection. Being a librarian, my job is to tell you about the collection. It documents, well, I call him Chuck, Chuck Irvin's work as a stage designer from 1970 to 2017. The collection consists of production files from many of the plays Urban worked on with correspondence, paint samples, rough sketches, inspirational imagery, notes, and more. Hand draftings, floor plans, and elevations. A distinguishing feature of the Charles Urban Theater collection and the work displayed in this exhibition is that it represents a career of entirely handcrafted and drafted work from undergraduate days to the present. These works represent methods and techniques that have largely been abandoned in recent years, but we preserve them here in the William H. Hannon Library in perpetuity for future generations of students and scholars. Before we begin tonight's program, I would like to thank the many people who curated the exhibit, worked on the exhibit, and made tonight's event possible. Again, Lauren Longwell, University Archiv Archivist, who curated the exhibition. Lauren, where are you? Stand, Lauren, stand. <laughs> I would also like to recognize the archives assistants, Marissa Ramirez and Jessica Guardado. Cynthia Becht, Head of Archives and Special Collections, who brought in the collection, recognizing its value. And Jesse Yu, one of Chuck's students who created the digital component of the exhibition that you will see in Archives and Special Collections. And last but not least, I would like to recognize Carol Raby, the library's event manager, who is responsible for the spectacular reception that will follow tonight's program. Carol, take a bow. <laughs> and now, without further ado, Kevin Wetmore, Chair of the Theater Arts Department, who will introduce tonight's special guest. Thank you, Dean Brinkley. This is one of those events where there are a whole series of people introducing each other, and then we get to the next <laughs> It's very exciting. We specialize that in the arts. Um, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Theater people, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, there we are. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce the man of the hour uh, with uh, a microphone with no cutoff switch. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to embarrass the gentleman, although I do have a story in a minute. Um, we are fortunate enough to have Professor Irvin with us. He has earned both his BA and MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I will not tell you the years. Uh, and he has since designed and taught all over the world, uh, notably in Colorado, certainly in the Midwest, in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota, in New York, and even in the Virgin Islands and Georgia. And correct me if I'm wrong, that's not how, how y'all doing, Georgia, but hello, how are you all doing? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he's been uh, a designer all over the world, and we are fortunate enough uh, for the past two decades to have had him as our resident scenic designer and professor of uh, design and technical theater here at LMU. Uh, and here's where the anecdote comes in. Um, 14 years ago, uh, when uh, I had hair, 
um, <laughs> and was a, a young Wet Behind the Ears professor. My first production here was called The Grand Tarot. Uh, it was written by Charles Ludlam under the influence of a great deal of chemicals back in the 60s. Uh, and the play itself is an experiment in playfulness and in uncertainty. 22 scenes in the play, 22 cards in the tarot deck. And every night you have someone in the audience <coughs> shuffle the deck and the order in which the cards are laid out is the order in which you perform the scenes. Yeah. Uh, and Chuck designed the set for it. It was the first production I did here. He and I sat down and he designed this beautiful playground for us. It literally was a playground. It had structures and platforms and jungle gyms to play on and uh, a wheel that could turn and we could all do all sorts of things with. And the cast was very physical and acrobatic. And as we stood there, once the set was constructed side by side looking at it, Chuck looked at it and said, you need a rope swing. <laughs> we had not talked about this in any design meeting. We had not rehearsed at all. I said, I said, what? He said, you need a swing. Why? It's a playground. Playgrounds need a swing. And he hung a rope the next day <laughs> that could swing from backstage all the way out over the audience. Oh, wow. And damn it, if he wasn't right, we use that thing more than any other part of that set. And to me, that sums up what it's like to work with Chuck. He is a, a classical designer in the sense that he comes in with ground plans, with models. He knows exactly what he wants to make. But then once it's constructed as a designer, he looks at it and says, it still needs something. This is what will make it actually function and work for this production. Chuck has been a fierce advocate for design within the department, a fierce advocate for theater within the university, and a fierce advocate for the university and the academy within the world. We are fortunate to have such a passionate de uh, defender who knows his craft so well, and it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome to the stage tonight my colleague, Charles E. Chuck Irvin. <laughs> Can everyone hear? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I've prepared some remarks rather than off the cuff so that I can get everything that I want said. said. But first of all, I'd like to welcome friends, colleagues, fellow theater artists, administrators, librarians, students, and so forth. Before I begin my remarks, I wish to thank the following by making, uh, for making this exhibition uh, and reception happened. Now, actually, all the people have been already identified, okay. uh, but I want to, once again, just thank uh, Dean uh, Francolini and the entire Hammond uh, Library staff, who have, over the years, always provided a welcoming and supportive foundation for events like this. I really appreciate everything you've done all the time, not just for this. Okay. Uh, and then, specifically, I would like to thank uh, uh, Cynthia Beck, and Lauren Zakowski Longwell, Marissa uh, Ramirez, and uh, Jesse Yu, my brains assistant, without uh, whose help, there's no way this could have happened. Okay? Uh, I also would like to thank Kevin Wetmore and the theater department for co sponsoring this uh, reception. Okay. Uh, and I would also like to acknowledge. My boyfriend of 15 years, Charlie Castano, who's here. <laughs> and, um, I want to, and Charles designed the costumes for Man of Mancha, which you will see in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, um, now for my formal remarks. Okay, I am a result of the American dream. My paternal, I've got to take my glasses off, I can't do this. Okay. <laughs> my paternal grandparents were immigrants from Bohemia in the early 1900s. My grandmother, a single woman, sailed across the sea to be met by a new country instead of a wall. Mm -hmm. She met my grandfather in Cleveland, where a Czech community had established itself. They moved to Wisconsin to find work. Their son, my father, a World War II veteran, was a blue-collar tool-and-die skilled craftsman who literally built the house in which I was raised. My mother's parents were tenant farmers with 11 children. As my Uncle Al said late in life, we didn't have much, but we had each other. My mother exemplified the mid-century homemaker mother, and we lived on the street that had a deep sense of community and shared values. Racine, Wisconsin was a manufacturing town. I remember being proud of the smell of foundries and bakeries being ever present. A baby boomer, 
I benefited from a superior education in public schools. My English and art teachers in high school taught me fundamentals of writing, painting, and drawing that eventually drew me to theater design and that I use to this day. Later, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with an MFA in scene design under the mentoring of John Azell, a brilliant artist, magnificent painter, and internationally recognized scene designer. Ezell, who only recently retired at the age of 88, <laughs> studied under Donald Anschlager, the founder of the design program at Yale. He, in turn, has served as an assistant to Dr. Edmund Jones, considered the father of a uniquely American form of scene design based on the new stagecraft of Europe. Through this lineage, I consider myself a great-grandson of Bobby Jones and my students his great-great-grandchildren. <laughs> you will see the evidence and result of this lineage in the exhibition. In marked contrast to modern times, my total indebtedness at the end of graduate school was $500. And all of that was on my American oil credit card. <laughs> my education had been heavily subsidized by the people in the state of Wisconsin who believed in the value of learning and art. I would not be here a professor of theater arts at LMU without such deep public support. The grandson of immigrants and tenant farmers, I am grateful to be here today as this exhibition of my work opens. Sometime in 2017, I approached Cynthia Beck, head of the Archives and Special Collections, about donating my entire career's worth of hand-drawn theater drafting, over 200 productions or projects, from my first class of stage design and undergraduate production assignments to the present day, excluding hair, which opens here at the Scoop Theater in two weeks. <laughs> she was very excited about establishing an archive and asked for any quote-unquote process materials I might provide. Being a bit of a pack rat, I had done a lot of quote-unquote process <laughs> and eventually donated four boxes stuffed with items in manila folders individually labeled for each show. For his help in sorting and preparing all of the material now in this archive, I am completely indebted to my Reigns research assistant, Jesse Yu, who also organized and prepared the video slideshow for the exhibit. Lauren Sikowski Longwell and Marissa Ramirez further sorted, organized, and created the archive. All of us collaborated in curating the current exhibition, which seeks, seeks to demonstrate the process of designing scenery from its imaginative, conceptual phase, uh, phase and research through the execution of sketches, drawings, drafting, and other documents and models, which ultimately led to the productions, some of which are shown in photographs in the gallery. It has been a wonderfully creative and cooperative process putting this show together. For me, a most interesting takeaway has been seeing what, out of all that was available, the librarians and archivists chose to display. <laughs> it is our hope that as you peruse the gallery today or in, on any weekday until May 10th, that we have been successful in our efforts. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you members of the panel we have gathered to provide uh, their personal and professional perspectives regarding this exhibition, entitled Making a Scene, the Process of Set Design. Time permitting, a question and answer session will follow. Uh, each of them has been asked previously uh, to, one, reflect on our work together hopefully with some good stories to tell, <laughs> and two, to discuss the value of an archive of this nature. Uh, now, do we want to have each person come up individually as I'm going to do one at a time? Is that good? Okay, so we'll start with Daniela Karagotsky. Daniela? Hello. Hello. You can go up here so you can talk. Uh, Daniela Karagowski, director and stage designer, graduated from the Leningrad Theater Academy in 1977. After graduation, he worked as the resident stage and costume designer <coughs> for the Leningrad Theater for Young Spectators and as a freelance designer for more than 80 productions around the USSR, including working with Anatoly Efros at the Taganka Theater in Moscow. Since 1989, he has worked in the United States as a stage designer and professor designing more than 300 productions in Los Angeles, the United States, and around the world for major opera companies, <coughs> regional theaters, and other venues. 
In 2005, he became the artistic director of Theater Pokolenyi in St. Petersburg, Russia, where he has since designed and directed more than 30 projects. I had known Daniela for nearly 30 years. We met while I was teaching at Carroll College, a small liberal arts college near Milwaukee. The Soviet Union was collapsing, and Daniela was traveling the United States giving lectures and showing his work. From that meeting developed a long-term friendship, which also opened me to the amazing world of Russian and Eastern European theater and designs. Because of him and his connections, I was able to travel to Tashkent, Uzbekistan, where I met Mark Weil of the Ilkhum Drama Theater, a leading artistic voice of perestroika in the U USSR. Other contacts in St. Petersburg, Moscow, and Prague led to my taking student productions to these cities to form cultural exchanges and to bring theater artists to the United States to work on productions in our small <coughs> theater department of only 40 majors in the middle of the country. <laughs> I directed three productions that Daniela designed at Carroll College, which required me to rethink and explore everything I had learned about American theater, which is obsessed with realism. <laughs> Images of these productions are in the slideshow. For this reason, I consider Daniela my second great theater design mentor after John Isel, Daniela Paragon. <laughs> oh. Go. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Say something. <laughs> oh, okay. Whatever. We're going to introduce each person individually. Yeah, okay. I, I okay. didn't know what the procedure is going to I mean, am, am I supposed to yes. do that? Yes. 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 <laughs> or you can come up here if you want. Uh, but then I will like uh, oh, displace you. Oh, okay. 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 All right. Um, yeah, that's a little bit better because at least I'm like seeing your face. Um, listen, um, <clears throat> um, Chuck warned me that uh, you know this is going to happen and uh, that I'm expected to. He said something like, uh, "Anecdotes are welcome." <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm actually, I, I don't know if I will get to, to anecdotes, but um, I'm, I'm sort of um, overwhelmed with almost sentimental uh, feelings because, um, uh, you know, we've been part of each other's lives for so long. And, uh, you know, Charles pretty much single-handedly is responsible for me getting stuck in the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's true. You know, it's uh, it's another mutual friend of ours, uh, Alvin Cleveland, who used to teach at the University of uh, South Carolina in Columbia. He's the one who, by accident, it's a very long and sort of strange story, but he basically at some point when I was straight out of Soviet Union and I didn't understand pretty much anything how this place works. I, you know, my, my, my understanding of how it uh, functions was based mostly on like William Faulkner and him. <laughs> As we well know, is not really the case. Um, at least not now, anyway. So, uh, uh, I, 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 I flew into Milwaukee and Chuck met me at the airport. <laughs> and then uh, somehow, I, I don't even remember if there was any sort of effort to cross the border between us because it was like really, I don't know, it was an, an instant friendship. And it kept going and it doesn't need any reinforcement or approval or whatever, it just sort of, happens. So, you know, um, I don't know, I'm just blessed with uh, a trustful friend. And, uh, and, and, you know, we also belong to the same profession, which is a, a strange craft. Uh, <laughs> and, and it really is. And, you know, we're sitting here, and I cannot come over the simple fact that designers don't, you know, it, that doesn't happen to us. <laughs> you know, we're sort of backstage people. <laughs> you know, our, our work, um, you know, is, is uh, 
you know, is, is, if it's recognized, it's recognized like after the, the whole thing is over. <laughs> so, you know, congratulations, Charles. <laughs> Chuck, um, I, I don't know, he has so many talents uh, w which normally people of our profession do not possess. Um, for example, you know, Charles is like a really gifted administrator. And I've seen it because, uh, you know, he and another friend, Dave Molson, used to run this little department that he was uh, telling me about, that Carroll College. And, uh, you know, about 20 minutes from Milwaukee. And boy, what was going on in that place is like really remarkable. I mean, the three plays that we managed to put together, they were Václav Havel's Temptation. Uh, uh, you know, uh, then it was... Uh, Elmer Rice. Uh, Elmer Rice's uh, 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 The Acting Machine, which is like a real map. I didn't have a clue. I never read it before Charles introduced me to this piece of literature. And it's a, yeah, it's a masterpiece. It's a remarkable m monument to early American playwriting. And till, till, till today, I try to expose my, my students uh, uh, in, in the United States to to display because, you know, check it out. I mean, it's like s scarily current. Uh, it's like really, uh, it's maybe, I don't know, King Ubu by Jari and uh, the Adding Machine, <coughs> the plays of the moment, so to speak. And then we did uh, this play which he dug out of, I don't even know where because it was the last play um, written by Federico Garcia Lorca, which is called Once Five Years uh, Past. And it's uh, like Lorca at its <coughs> craziest, <laughs> if, you can, if, if, if that tells you something. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and, you know, I'm very grateful for, for the words that Chuck uh, said about uh, our collaboration because uh, not only I somehow managed to uh, do something to him, but he certainly managed to do a lot to me. And, uh, uh, you know, if, I've, if I persevered and survived in uh, um, sort of the culture of American theater and stage design specifically. To a large degree, Charles, I'm afraid, I don't know if it's good or not, <laughs> but it's you. <laughs> That's for sure. So, um, <clears throat> because those were rather outrageous things, and uh, Ch Charles, uh, you know, always had sort of this quiet courage about crossing borders and, uh, you know, not being confined to limitations. And he does it in this very simple, quiet, kind of a convincing, simple way. You know, it, it's no proclamations, no, not, none of that. Uh, it's, it's done with this sort of a Midwestern temperament. <laughs> and it's fantastic, because I, I know for sure that there are many, many, many people people uh, uh, today who are very grateful to, to Chuck for having this one quality of sort of organically being a translator of cultures and the crosser of borders. And borders are artificial. You know, I, I, I mean, we all know that. Um, we live in funny, strange times when, um, you know, the, the, the political forces that are to a degree in control uh, are somehow trying to sort of reinstate the opposite. But it's temporary because there is no, it's, uh, you know, it's only, uh, it's the, the forces of the past uh, fighting with um, something that is inevitable. And you cannot <coughs> really stop it, <laughs> you know. 
each, each time I go in front of my class, which I have today, of you know, 30 something <coughs> undergraduates in a public American university, I teach at CSULB. And I look at their faces and what? Walls? How are they going? Are they, are they serious? Have, you, have they ever looked at their faces? Have they seen those young ones? I mean, it's just completely insane. It is just crazy. Anyways, back to Charles. <laughs> you know, he has this anecdote. He has the anecdote. I, I, I can I just remember the punchline, <laughs> which is which happens to me in my old age lately. I, you know, I don't remember the plot. I just remember the, the finale, <laughs> which of course kills it. But when we just met uh, years and years ago, almost 30 years ago, uh, for some reason, you told me that many times, that I called you a dirty capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because I had an upstairs attic. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that I had converted into a studio. And Daniela walked in and said, yeah. you capitalist. <laughs> the first time I'd ever been called a capitalist. <laughs> Ever. Yeah. Well, the, 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 um, the truth is, I, I don't know, capitalist, communist, socialist, whatever the, the, the name tag or the, the, the tag is. Um, wh one thing I know for sure, and I've always known that, and uh, I know that it's not going to change, that uh, Charles uh, Irvin is like one solid guy, you know, honest, uh, Full of heart, committed, you know, the one who's not going to turn his com uh, commitments around. A, 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 you know, if Charles believes in something, you better trust that that's, uh, that will stand. So um, I'll just use this moment for a little sentimental thank you, Charles, for a, a friendship. Of for, you know, for all those years. Yeah. <laughs> Our next panelist is Pamela Shaw. Pamela Shaw is not only one of the best teachers of costume design, construction, and makeup that I have known throughout my career, she is an accomplished regional theater and film costume designer, most notably serving as the assistant costume designer for the artist which won the Oscar that year for Best Picture in Costume Design. She was assistant costume designer for the TV sensation Vampire Diaries, and in 2015, she was the costume designer for the off-Broadway show Lonesome Travel. Currently, she is an associate professor at Santa Barbara City College, where she has designed extensively for the theater group at Santa Barbara City College, a company which combines student and local talent in highly professional productions as part of the curriculum. Moreover, she is a forceful member of the, of the design unions in Los Angeles, serving two terms as vice president of the Costume Designers Guild, IATC Local 892, and currently as chair of the Western Region Board of the United Scenic Artists, IATC Local 8, 829, on which I also sit. Working with Pamela on shows and on the Western Region Board has opened my eyes to the reality, joys, and struggles of professional costume design in ways never imagined in the scene shop. <laughs> I have known Pamela and her family for over 10 years, beginning when she designed costumes at LMU for several seasons. She now resides in Santa Barbara, but incredibly manages to maintain an active presence here in Los Angeles. Pamela Shaw. <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. That was great. Um, I actually came to Loyola, I think, in 2005, because Chuck was on sabbatical. <laughs> so I came to teach the collective class of costume set and lighting design, and then also I had to teach stagecraft. So it was so great when Chuck came back, he said, now are you teaching orthographic drawing? Because this was currently slightly out of favor, and I said, well, actually, 
no, that's quite a big mystery to me. And he said, well, actually, it was something that really opened my eyes to being able to see something from every angle and how you could actually unfold the box on the page so that it was very, very transparent and clear about how it could come to be. And I think that was one thing that cemented our relationship. That and the fact that the first thing we did was the Grand Tarot, was the uh, sort of this wild extravaganza that included a giant circus wheel. And Chuck said, well, I have this idea about dyeing 40 yards of silk and we're hanging these giant curtains. And he said, do you have any ideas? I said, yeah. So we went out and bought big wash tubs like this. We bought camp stoves to put underneath. We put it outside the back of the theater and we had big one by three sticks <laughs> completed these wild chemistry of that. I said, what color do you want? So we did color swatching, mixed the dye, put it in here. We had, this was with the student class. <laughs> and we had these literally silk that would go from Chuck to me four times. And we're trying to get this uniform product. And we're like the witch's brew, right? Here's one. Here's two. We're like this, okay. Now we had two students. You stand here and then spell each other so that we could get the orange, the red, the safflower yellow. And it was a really successful collaboration. And we had a great time doing it. And it was a very novel production because they used these tarot cards that, is Kevin here? Yes, yes. Kevin. Yes. Here. And he said, oh no, we can do it. This is no problem whatsoever. We're just gonna, you know, shuffle the deck and however it unfolds, we'll do it in that order every night. And it's like 26 scenes or something, right? 22 plus introduction and conclusion. There you go. So sometimes you start with 22, sometimes you start with three, sometimes you start with whatever. And so that was our first crazy thing that we did. And actually, it was, it was a lot of fun. And I think that both Kevin and Chuck were a little, uh, you know, they were a little t nervous about me, as this year I was this new, like, adjunct teacher and the costume design class designed the costumes and each student was assigned three characters they talked to Kevin he came in and we talked of course we read the play we talked about the characters and you know was in the middle here they were doing the thriller dance from Michael Jackson <laughs> right in the middle like oh now we're gonna have the dance break and they said, now are you sure that they can really do this? And it was actually terrific because then we could show the director, here's, here's three choices for these three characters, here's three choices, and they were overlapping. So many people had, each student got one character. And it worked out really well. It was really a lot of fun and the students had a lot of ownership of, this is my costume. And Chuck was willing to go along with it. In addition to that, um, Knowing that Chuck was an amazing, amazing painter, a few years ago when I was when I was starting in Santa Barbara, because I went up there in 2011, um, I felt like they were in trouble in terms of trying to get this very realistic set painted. And we have a big theater; um, it's almost 400 seats. It's a modified. We have a small theater too, but it's a very different configuration <coughs> than here. So you're filling the space in a different way. And I said, well, you know, I know somebody that can paint. <laughs> Let me see if he's available to come up for three days and then paint. So Chuck came up and painted, and then he came up and designed for the uh, equity company, the Ensemble Theater Company in Santa Barbara. And they had a um, particular theme. The director brought him in from here. They had a particular theme. It was supposed to be everything that was visual, visual was going to be within a certain painter, right? Edward Hopper. Edward Hopper. Mm -hmm. And so that really narrowly defines what, how you can express the visual story of the play. <coughs> and Chuck did, as he always does, did these amazing paint elevations and had this really clear view of what Edward Hopper would be. And they put it up on the stage. Of course, you're painting part of it, you're doing other things. And when the artistic director came in, he said, the set is the only thing that is reflecting Edward Hopper. 
<laughs> you other people, you need to get it together. <laughs> so then when I was moving from Santa Barbara, I had to come over and paint my garage door. <laughs> so he helped me out a lot. We had kind of a tragedy happen in my family, and Chuck, you know, it's like, it's like Danilo said, well, first of all, I had a master's degree, and I was going to go for an MFA, and I actually ended up at Cal State Long Beach. And I said, I didn't know that Chuck knew Danila. <laughs> and I'm in Danila's class, and here's this crazy Russian, and we're, you know, <laughs> deconstructing. So he's very political, I mean, you couldn't tell, right? <laughs> but, so he's very political, and we had to respond to a plane crash visually. And I'm doing this crazy thing, and I cover it with silk, and I spray it with water, and then I put, you know, polish all the way around the outside, and it's really kind of loose things. And I said to Chuck, hey, do you know this guy, Danila Kordogoska? And he said, do I know him? <laughs> do I know him for years? So it was really great to actually see from both angles this idea of who Chuck was from somebody that has known him for a long time, from somebody who was a colleague, and then also, so Chuck was my mentor, and then in some ways, I have been able to be his mentor, and it's been such a pleasure. So I am the chair of the Western Region Board for the United Scenic Artists Local 829, which is all scenic artists, costume, scenic, lighting, projection design, and studio painters in on the West Coast for all regional theaters. And I knew Chuck was a member. He came in through the exam in Chicago. And he was, I knew his member when I was here at Loyola. And I said, so, you know, what are you doing? I said, you can file a contract for every show that you're doing. At, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's an 800-seat <coughs> theater, a 200-seat theater, a 50-seat theater, because you can do a project only. And I said, you know, really, the, if you're working as an independent designer, the only way that you'll ever have any kind of a pension or health benefits is if you have all of these individual parties pay into your health and welfare because we don't have any other way. If we didn't have the union, we would be working from $500 job to $500 job or something like that. So uh, when we had a vacancy on the board, I said, Chuck, run, come and run for the board. So we've done two, we've had two really great experiences. One where we met downtown, and last year, of course, we had the landslide, so I came down on the train, and uh, we went to the Martin Luther King breakfast, which is held downtown, and it is amazingly inspirational. We were both there with John Lewis, who came and talked about crossing the Edmund Beck Bridge, and then we were there last year, and we came out, and it was the Women's March. So I said, I have to get back to the train by this certain time. We went to the breakfast, we walked back through the Women's March. We, I have this greatest picture of these selfies. I should have sent them to you so you could. <laughs> and, uh, but he is a great supporter. He's willing to risk a lot of things. And I'll tell you one non-theater, I could tell you two non-theater things, but one really non-theater thing. Um, a few years ago, we went on a rafting trip together. <laughs> On the river of no return. Doesn't that sound exciting? <laughs> <laughs> and it was not a rafting trip. You know, it's like we pay a guy three hundred fifty dollars, and then these other people bought the food, and there's three rafts that don't match, and every day we had a little tragedy. <laughs> so we're driving up there because Chuck's. You know, it's so interesting for such a great guy. He's like never been anywhere. I said, well, we can drive up there. We can drive to Idaho. Oh, I've never been there. Okay, great. So we get in my van, and we're driving up, and I think my son was here. We dropped him off at horse camp on the way. Here we are going along. It's on this long dirt road. Anyway, we finally get there. I packed my things in my dry bag, and Chuck's packed his things in his dry bag. <laughs> we get, literally, every single day there's tragedy. The first day, we get a big rip in the bottom of the boat. Well, we know how to make a patch and sew it together, and here's Pam sewing it together. <laughs> so Chuck and I are in the same raft this day, and our raft gets wedged in a rapids like this, right? And you guys know Chuck wears hearing aids. But he doesn't have them in because we're on the water. And if he goes in, they'll ruin so he's here. So we're stuck. And then he says, 
I don't really swim very well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I practiced my life jacket yesterday. <laughs> so we've, there were four of us in the raft. And we said, you know what? Okay, we sent Marianne first. Then we sent Chuck because if he got stuck somewhere or if he went forward, Marianne could catch him. And then I went and then Harry went. Because I'm a really strong swimmer, I thought, well, we're going to make it. And it's like, I thought, imagine the courage. You can't hear, and you can't swim. And we had to go up on a rock like this, like, you know, we're crawling up like that. And the raft is wedged like this. And we have offloaded all of our stuff to the side because it won't move. And then you have to jump off. And you have to... You know, have the faith that your life jacket's going to hold you up. And he did not panic. He might have been panicked inside. <laughs> and we got to the, you know, and the eddy will take you around. You know, when you're on a river, you have to just know that that's going to happen. And he jumped in, and we made it safe. So that tells you a lot about who he is. Tell you that the life jacket almost came off when I jumped in the water. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, the next person is Christian Lobano. Christian Lobano, the artistic director of the Sierra Madre Playhouse, and I began working on a production of A Christmas Story in February of 2017 with his question of, quote, can we even fit this show with so many scenes based on a popular movie of the same name into a small 99 seat theater with no wing or fly space? <laughs> a successful development of the theater design required fitting a puzzle of shapes and playing spaces into a very small box. Over the next several months, with so many, con so many concerns were addressed that the show was able to go into rehearsal for a holiday run from November to the end of December 2017. The success of the show was such that it was revived in 2018 with plans for it to potentially become a bian biannually mounted Christmas tradition at the Sierra Madre Playhouse. As we got to know each other, Christian and I discovered that we shared many friends and experiences based in Milwaukee, where he had gone to the professional actor training program at UWM. The artistic quality, sense of solidarity, and enthusiasm evident in the Sierra Madre Playhouse demonstrates once again the ability of live theater to thrive in supportive communities some distance from the big houses in any downtown. The culture of this theater reminded me and reminds me of the civic pride and artistic aspiration I encountered for 20 years designing for the Racine Theater Guild as my ex-wife and I raised our family in the Midwest. <coughs> Under his leadership, the Sierra Madre Playhouse has earned many ovation nominations and awards, an LA Times Critics Choice listing, and many Broadway World and Stage Scene LA nominations and awards. He has performed at the Oregon and Utah Shakespeare Festivals, the American Players Theater, International City Theater in Long Beach, the Court Theater in Chicago, and the PCPA, among other regional theaters. Christian. Well, I'm thrilled to have been invited. Um, I am probably the person in this room who has known Chuck the shortest period of time. Uh, I was equally thrilled that the archivists have uh, chosen to highlight a Christmas story in uh, the work that you can see. Uh, it, it, Charles is right. Uh, our, our theater stage is about 25 by 35. Uh, it's a converted movie theater that was uh, originally built in 1910 as a furniture store, converted in 1923 <laughs> into a silent movie theater. Um, and then in the 80s, it was decommissioned as a, as a movie theater and converted into a playhouse. Uh, it was a community theater for a very long time, and now I say that we are um, a theater of our community. Um, I've had actors who've been on Broadway have uh, worked at our theater. So, uh, a Christmas Story was a huge challenge. Uh, for those of you who know the movie, there are a number of scenes in the play um, that follow the movie. Um, 
there's it's a lot of stuff that happens outside and inside, and, and I was really flummoxed about how we would get it to fit. Uh, Charles and I had uh, several great meetings at a Starbucks downtown LA where he would take the train down and I would come down from work and we would meet there to go over the plans and to revise the ideas. Um, Charles is really one of the greatest designers I've ever worked with, really truly. And what I love from designers, whatever craft that is theirs, is that they um, can, can inspire you in ways that you have no idea that you can be inspired. So we riffed off each other, and what if we do this, what if we do that? And then um, we got it into the theater, and uh, his painterly skills um, made a real, you'll see in, in the, the, the work that's included in the archive, um, it just made a tremendous, a tremendous um, postcard or a Christmas card, um, I talked to, to him about the sense of nostalgia and uh, the sense of memory I wanted, because it's set in the 40s. And um, he was able to capture all of that and um, was always willing to um, go with my crazy inspira ins inspirations that, that I drew from the work that he was sharing with me. Um, I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled that the archive um, is is collecting and saving his work. I work with a lot of young designers who wouldn't know how to do what he does. Um, you know, it's all done on computer, and that's great because you can see it from all angles, and that and that's that's there's something to be said for that. But there's also something about um, uh, an artist putting his or her hand to paper and painting and sketching and drawing that way that a computer cannot, uh, cannot match. There's um, some soul pours out onto the paper. Um, and seeing those drawings, seeing that artwork, seeing that art that he created for me um, inspired so many moments that he has no idea that, they, that he inspired. Um, so I'm, I'm really thrilled that that you have identified and seen the value of that because young set designers, young designers generally, people working in the theater, won't have that experience of working with someone who can do that the way that um, Charles has. And I think that that alone makes this really a remarkable experience. Um, I'm hoping now that he's retired or retiring that he will be able to work with us a little bit more. Because it's really, truly amazing if you could see what he was able to do. You know, I told him that it's always important to me in my shows that there be something that is utterly surprising, what I call little gifts to the audience. And um, there, we, we created this, this fencing on one side that would create a sort of an outdoor effect which opened up to reveal Higby's department store. And the audience was totally surprised because they had no expectation that there was anything behind there. And that I loved that he could give me that in our small theater. So Charles, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for allowing me to express to these people how much I love and respect and admire the work that you did with me and clearly have done for so long. Um, and I am really, truly hoping that we can work together on some other really impossible projects. <laughs> so, thank you. We have one uh, final um, uh, panelist. Uh, J. Mills Fagan. I remember exactly the moment I met J. Mills Fagan. He was a student server at an LMU function in the fall of 2002 when I arrived as a new faculty member char charged with designing Archibald McLeish's play JB. A film and television production major, class of 2004, Jay Mills was interested in learning about scene design and because of his already well-developed artistic and graphic skills, became my assistant on that show, my first at LMU painting a series of large circus posters which adorned the Stroop Theater Auditorium. Next, he built the models for Diane Benedict's production of The Seagull, which I designed, 
followed by his own main stage debut, design, debut uh, designing the scenery for LMU's stunning minimalist conceptual production of Hamlet. When he met Jan Duchek, head of the scenography program at the, of the Czech Academy of Art, Damu, in Prague, who had come to LMU to design sets and costumes for Catherine B. Fried's production of The Persians, for which I designed the lighting, Jay Mills decided to pursue cinegraphic design at Damu with Mr. Duchet, graduating with an MFA in 2006. For this, he had to learn the Czech language. <laughs> the only time I actually had Josh in class was when I taught American scene design at Damu during as part of my sabbatical in 2005. Born into a family of artists, Jay Mills claims that he became a designer almost by default. For almost 20 years, his career has proven to be as eclectic as his personal taste. Along with his international design education, he draws on his experience in theatrical and film set design, men's fashion, and marketing to bring a dramatic flair to his creative practices. He is currently a creative director at 1540 Productions, where he collaborates with major Hollywood studios and international companies to design red carpet premieres and events around the globe. Jamie Owens. Yeah. Okay, so I'm definitely one of those back of house people, not normally in front of the stage. Um, but I want to say first thank you for, uh, well, not just inviting me here tonight, but for really giving me, <clears throat> giving me a life. Um, he said it right, we met at Loyola, but I was never actually a student of his at Loyola. Um, although, as soon as we met, he instantly became my mentor. Um, in many ways, not just in craft. But um, I'm kind of like that prodigal son you know, I would come to him and say, like, hey, come on, let's, let's do this project. Um, am I doing it right? And he'll say, well, you're kind of there. And then, uh, and then I would try to, you know, just, you know, snow him over and say, like, well, it's minimalism, you know, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> and he could always see right through me and always pushed me to do better. Um, yeah, I... What I learned from Chuck beyond, like, yes, I was one of those hand-drafting people, too. Um, <laughs> beyond, like, how to handle a brush, um, how to use color. Um, I'm a very dark soul person, and uh, he always saw that I could add a little spark of life. In fact, that set for Hamlet, and it was, like, stark black. Um, <laughs> I, I think every model that I made for you was based in black and then you had me add color to it later. Um, <laughs> yeah, he always pushed me um, with, you know, just a few words that still ring true to me today um, with every challenge that I face. And he told me that you can do it. Uh, giving me confidence that I still use in all these crazy projects that I do now. Um, I'm at a production company that we do, just last year we did over 360 productions. And uh, they're all over the world, they're big and small. Um, I have my hands in a lot of them, not all of them. But um, I've never had to do the kind of design work that I am doing now, but it's a salary to a job, you know, so <laughs> as a set designer you take it. Um, but yeah, he, he still, I'll still send you know my work over to him and say like, hey, by the way, uh, this is what I'm doing. What do you think? And months will go by, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll get together with him and we'll have uh, you know a meal and um, talk about design for hours and hours and hours and um, just get lost in each other's company. And like I said, he's been a mentor to me in more ways than just craft. He has taken. Um, been a personal example of what a decent human being should be. He's been like a father figure to me. Um, I did actually take a class under him when I was studying in Prague. Um, and we shared an apartment together, which was awesome. <laughs> um, I kind of wish that I was the one in need of the hearing aids when he was snoring, but... No! <laughs> There's your anecdote. 
<laughs> but um, yeah, I um, like I said, I owe so much to this man because he brought color into my life. He celebrated um, traditional work, um, which makes me proud to say that I can still do it the old school way. Um, he challenged me to do new things. Um, I did teach us one semester, my one little bit of teaching here at Loyola, um, where I tried to do some innovative things with integrating different departments, and I got that idea from Chuck. Um, he recognized in me, because I came here to be a you know film director, which was stupid. Um, and after meeting Chuck, he was the one who said, yeah, you know, you know designers are born, they're not made. And if you're a designer, you just know it, and I'm going to show you how you can really do something with this. And he just took me under his wing and made me do things that I never thought I could even do. Um, I had never designed a theater show <laughs> when I did Hamlet, and um, with his guidance and you know my morbidly black soul, like we were able to <laughs> put it together, and it turned out like pretty awesome. Um, he says he still has a piece of my model <laughs> in his office, which is amazing. But if you've seen the collection, you know that um, he doesn't throw away anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, about the collection, as designers, it's really, um, it's really unique to be able to see a collection like this. Um, talk about the process of design. How about the process of becoming a designer? Um, looking at early works to current works, um, the mastery just gets better. And I think it's evident when you look at the way that he can handle a pencil on paper, um, the way that he can combine color where you didn't think color was possible, um, spending hours with him painting backdrops and dabbing brushes on the stage floor, um, I've actually learned to interpret light differently, um, interpret um, costumes <coughs> as sculpture, as structure, and um, yeah, I've never I've never been touched by any single person more than by Chuck. And like I said, Prodigal Son, I come and go in and out of his life, um, a lot less frequently than I should. <laughs> Uh, because I do owe so much to him, but um, it's it's been a privilege to stay in touch with someone who genuinely cares for you, even though they never see you. Um, someone who's taken an interest in me from the first handshake to still following up and making sure that I'm adding enough drama to my drawings. <laughs> <laughs> um, this collection it means everything to someone like me who's been able to study under him and learn from him, but it's also impressive just to have a collection of set design. Um, around the world, it's a craft that um, doesn't really get the credit that it's due because theater, um, film, television, um, all of these little bits of what the world would call entertainment design um, tend to get lost. And if it's not burned into celluloid of some film or, you know, on a TV show or whatever, a lot of these great moments, especially in theater, they just get lost. And to have this collection is impressive. And I thank Loyola for that. I hope that the students get exposure to it. And I hope that, um, I hope that there are people out there like me who can really derive a lot of inspiration from something like that. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. So, I think we have to, uh, do we have time for questions or do we have, okay. We have a short period uh, of question and answers and then there's some food and drink in the, uh, uh, out in the uh, lobby out there. So, anybody have questions? Yes. And to make sure you speak it loudly so it reaches the question. Um, 
can you give us a capsule version of your process going from <coughs> first reading something to designing something? Oh my goodness. No, I'm sorry. Uh, well, uh, I would say, first of all, I'm going to answer that in a slightly different way. I'm going to say that in order to be a really good set designer or a theater person, you have to be a person with an exceptional liberal arts education. Mm. <laughs> you have to be able to read a play and understand it from a literary point of view, a metaphorical point of view, a poetic point of view. You have to understand people and what's going on in the psyches of the characters, why they are doing what they're doing, what the real conflicts are, not the superficial blah, 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 what's really what they really want, and then you have to understand space. As a theater designer, you have to understand that this is going to occur in a space that is not reality, that we're creating an illusion. And so when you create this illusion, you take out a lot of things, and you emphasize certain things, and you simplify things, and that's what makes it an art. Because it's not just putting a camera up or taking a photograph. You are choosing everything, just as actors choose everything when Everything falls off. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to understand what you're really dealing with. That this is not just pictures, it is an event. <coughs> and the event is actually a, a, um, oh, a, an I, I like to say it's an exchange of energy between an audience and actors. Mm -hmm. And that the theater actually happens there. <coughs> In that exchange, not on the stage, not in the audience, but it's in this energy that goes back and forth. And that, I think, is the single thing that truly makes theater different from film. Because we, you cannot affect a film once it's cut and edited and showing. The audience can be crying or laughing or walking out or bored or whatever else, but the film doesn't change at all. But a theater production completely changes if the audience gets up and walks out or they're booing or they're mad or crying or whatever else because there is this interaction that's going on. And that is actually what the designers and the production are striving for is to create that synergy, that, that energy exchange so that people get lifted out of their everyday experiences. Now, I don't know if that answered your question. Well, perfect. But I got off on the <laughs> Anybody else got a question? Way back there, you got to really speak up now. Um, so, you gave us kind of how you see it now, but how has that changed since you started? In other words, what's the thing that most changed about how you see set design from when you started to the oh. little synopsis you gave now? What's what did you start changed? with, maybe? Daniela, help me. <laughs> <laughs> what's changed? Oh, it just on everything. Um, uh, when I first started, uh, back in the 70s, with my teacher, John Zell, American realism was absolutely dominant as a mode of design. It was an expensive, clunky kind of process, but there was a dynamic going on at that time from the 60s and the 70s of avant-garde changes, some of which have crept into our consciousness most of which happened because Americans are still completely obsessed with realism in film. Uh, they, they don't quite get abstraction or conceptual things. They say, what weird thing is that we just watched? Now, if you did it in Russia, people would say, oh, I get it immediately. It's weird. Oh, my God. That's what? When we did this production of uh, Once Five Years Past, which, let me tell you, was splendid. It was absolutely beautiful expression of surrealism. Well, most Americans don't have the faintest idea what surrealism even is, much less how they're going to respond to it. And so people were like, what was that? Because they, their consciousness was not connected to it. And, um, and I don't know, I don't know. To some degree, we have become preoccupied with effect. We have become preoccupied with spectacle. Uh, with things looking jazzy, and most of the time we've forgotten what the content is. What are you trying to say? What's the point? What are, what are we saying about human nature, about, about the, the dynamics of life? What are we saying about the political currents that are occurring in the world 
today that are absolutely going to affect what happens in the future. I think the theater, the theater is at a point right now where it needs to make a stand. It's got to get reinvolved in assimilating and understanding what what's really going on, and then make a statement about it instead of mamby pamby kind of imitating it. And uh, I know that when I was uh, uh, an undergraduate in the 1960s, when the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights thing was very much part of everyone's consciousness, there was all kinds of experimentation and new strange things going on. Uh, and I'm waiting for that to reemerge at this particular time. That, I think, is the thing that I hope happens next. Because if we stay stuck in our kind of ordinary Oh, isn't it nice? Aren't we great? We've done everything perfect. You know, realism, suburban sitcom kind of stuff that we often see. Uh, we're going to lose because mm. the, the theater is not going to be dynamic. We've got to reconnect with what is really going on and really affecting people. And so I don't know if that answers that question. Because it's not really a question about how you design it, but what you design it for. What you're trying to say. And I always to say something. <laughs> <laughs>